Hey everybody, Yehuda Sunshine here for another really exciting episode of the Malware Free Broadcast. Uh, today we are honored to have Vic Malloy, uh, Product Manager of the Texas Cybersecurity Compliance Program at the University of Texas San Antonio. Thanks for joining us, Vic. Very nice to see you. And also, uh, ODIC CEO, Dr. Oren Atan. Oren, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to, to speak with us today. Hello. So we are gathered here today to speak about something, yeah, you thought it was holy matrimony, right? To speak about <laughs> journeys in cyber education, guiding digital immigrants and digital natives. And what, what I think is really fascinating about this conversation is Vic and, and Oren both have extensive military cyber experience and then have transitioned this experience to, to mentor the next generation, in Oren's case in the private sector, and in Vic's case uh, through university cybersecurity education programs. And I think that it's really, it's gonna give us a really good opportunity to discuss how this experience can impact the next generation and how the these different touchstones have been able to, to shape and guide their lens in being able to, to guide the next generation of cyber professionals. So, so maybe we could start off by uh, Vic introducing yourself a little bit, telling us about your, your background and, and kind of how you got into cyber. Sure thing. And first and foremost, I want to thank you and your fantastic uh, uh, audience and staff for allowing me this opportunity to share my experience and my journey uh, from failure to success, I would say, because I pretty much failed my way to success, as, as some would say. But uh, prior military, uh, joined in 1987, eons ago. Uh, before, it was a good year. I remember being cyber. born then. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so that's when I started my journey. Um, it was when we had the... Uh, the trash 80s from 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 Radio Shack, uh, and we were using those as word processors uh, for supporting our military operations. And and here we are, you know, fast forward 2021. Uh, cyber is now its own command, and uh, running full spectrum capabilities um, had the opportunity to uh, once again be in the Air Force. Uh, conclude my career uh, as a information technology director for the National Security Agency here in San Antonio, uh, overseeing full spectrum operations and then transitioning into the initial uh, stand up of Air Force cyber and then transitioning uh, in a role to be a battle manager uh, with the United States Cyber Command and uh, retiring in 2015 and figuring out, okay, Vic, now you got to grow up. What you going to do next? <laughs> and uh, went to the private sector, uh, banking and, in, and insurance and did uh, not the executive type work, but no kidding. OK, big. Now you're going to actually, you know, get in there and do administration and do uh, provisioning of user accounts and and then move on into policy development and then move on into uh, user awareness training and so forth. And so uh, taking the technical side, non-technical side, and and bringing that to full spectrum. Uh, while I was doing that, uh, someone said, hey, Vic, there's a nonprofit, uh, Cyber Texas Foundation, and their focus is the next generation. And so no kidding, you know, when that opportunity came up, I said, sure, I, I will put my hand, my hand to the plow. And, and I'll tell that story later on because uh, I made a promise and uh, I under-promised and over-delivered. So we'll talk about that. And we, we'll also bring in some stuff about Pivot. Always, always a good to position here. to be in. Yes. <laughs> uh, so Oren, maybe you could tell us a little bit about, about your background and your military experience in cyber as well. Well, first of all, I would refer to Vic's uh, outstanding CV. I definitely were recruiting for Odix. I mean, with this experience, it is great. Uh, Off great. Offline, we're giving him an offer. Don't worry. <laughs> Te University of Texas San Antonio, beware. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so um, I also spent over 25 years with the Israel Defense Forces. Uh, we started with the uh, cyber and hackers uh, much before even it uh, diffused to the civilian market. Uh, I'm uh, more on the technical side. 
I started as uh, on the technical route and I was the head of the cybersecurity unit of the Israel Defense Forces. Uh, I retired as a colonel. Uh, in Israel, uh, this unit is within the signal branch uh, of the IDF. Uh, and in fact, I was responsible for protecting all the uh, IDF infrastructure against cyber attacks, which we saw along the years becoming more and more severe, more and more lethal. The hackers become uh, more, uh, 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 you know, very, very sophisticated. And it was a kind of you woke up every morning uh, to a new challenge. So it's a, it's, it was a real challenge along the years uh, to do that. Uh, after my retirement, I went to the uh, civilian market and I uh, founded Odix with a partner. Uh, my partner, also David, he was the responsible for the Cyber Academy at the Israel Defense Forces. So we, together we established the company and I'm now acting as the, the CEO. Um, it's, a, it's a pure uh, tech company, a uh, cybersecurity company, but always my role is here, you know, recruiting, you know, young people, try to provide them not only with the tech skills, but also with values and other uh, things that you really get through your uh, military service. And I'm sure Vic knows what I'm talking about. Uh, so uh, we probably elaborate on this in a few minutes. For sure. So before we, we kind of dive into to how your experience and, and dealing with the professionals in cyber has kind of changed in the past 20 years, I kind of want to talk about this interesting intersection that, that, that Vic and Oren have, the, the Texas connection. You know, I, I think it's, it's really interesting to see how, how Texas has become this cybersecurity hub. And Israel, you know, we, we, we get that notoriety, but Texas also has that, that backing. So, so Oren, what, what was your experience in Texas? What's your, what's your uh, relationship with the Longhorns? So uh, it's a known secret that I spent three years in Texas uh, with the University of Texas at Arlington. I graduated both my master and PhD, both of them in E from the University of Texas at Arlington, long time ago. Uh, if you'd like to realize how long it was, so I was connected to the uh, mainframe in the University of, of Texas at Austin in a 9600-baud modem. Uh, does that make sense? <laughs> <laughs> you can only find those in museums now and behind so, the glass, right? <laughs> so, so th these were the times, and um, but uh, since then I, I get in, in love with Texas. I travel a lot uh, all over Texas. Of course, San Antonio with the Riverwalk, with the Alamo and all these places. Uh, and in Arlington, Dallas, Fort Worth, metropolitan area. It's, it's a great state uh, and I love the people. Um, even the, the picture behind me is, uh, is from Texas with a, a very nice story behind it. But Yuda, just if you allow me to, to tell the story, if you I, have I, time. I, I, I'll, hum I'll humor you. But just because it's our own broadcast, I would have to cut you off maybe somewhere else. But I'm going to give you I'm going to give you two minutes, Oren. Okay. All right. So uh, I, I spent three years uh, in in Texas, and uh, I rented the house over there. And you know we have a very nice house. And about like a uh, couple of weeks before we went back to Israel, I was mowing the grass outside, and suddenly my neighbor came over to me, and I told him, you know, in two weeks, I'm going back to Israel. So I said, wow, are you from Israel? Oh, are you kidding me? I told him, yes, he was our, my neighbor, but you know, we say hello, hello, but not more than that. So he said, okay, come over to my house. I came over to his house and it turned out that he's a painter and he paints all the landscapes from Israel. 
the Holy Lands for both the Judaism and Christianity and uh, Jerusalem and uh, Nazareth and uh, all this. And he told me, you know what, pick every picture you want. And I picked the picture behind me because, you know, it's not from Israel, it's from Texas. You know, I should <laughs> come back with a picture from Israel. I mean, I have it all the time. So, so this is a nice story for, you know, my, my time in Texas and uh, really, really great experience. I revisited many times afterwards and uh, uh, really look forward to working with uh, the University of Texas San Antonio and with Vic and his guys. So, so Vic, I okay, got so, 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 so since so since yeah. you're telling Texas stories, I got to tell my Israel story. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I've made several visits to Israel, and uh, I love the land. I love the people. Love it so much that when I went to uh, Zvat, uh, which is in the northern uh, area, uh, my wife and I now have the Shema as our wedding band. So, uh, so we, we, we definitely, so, so I got my Israel connection right here. Yeah. I don't know what's connection. more impressive, the, the Shema and the wedding band or your pronunciation of Svat, two points to Vic. <laughs> TZF is oh, one of yo, those Vic, things that's know. hard for, for non-Israelis for some reason. I don't know why it doesn't translate so well. <laughs> yeah. And, and and oh by the way, still still um, you know feeling the hurt from this year's loss that happened uh, uh, during uh, Shimon Bayat uh, Bayokai's uh, celebration and the loss there. Uh, it it did not go lost on us here in Texas, at least in in my community, and uh, we we wept. It, it it really hit us to the to the heart uh, that during that celebration, especially coming out of this COVID. Uh, and the time of joy and celebration and, mm -hmm. and people wanting to get together that uh, this tragic loss happens. But uh, but anyway, uh, more more joyous times, uh, you know, going to King David Citadel and, and kicking back there going like, you know, this is, you know, the place to be on planet Earth. And, and that's <laughs> even after coming back from South Africa, you know, about, about a month ago with my family, uh, I, I, you know, Israel is near dear in our hearts. So we lo lo love the sharks. Texas connection, but I think the Israel connection is even more. <laughs> <laughs> Say again. Oh, I'm glad to see that that the old city can compete with sharks. You know, no. South Africa. We've all seen the David Attenborough, but the old city and, and Jerusalem. It's a different energy. Not right. Quite, not quite the same intensity. Similar. Um, right. Just to <laughs> just to bring yeah, it back to, yeah. to the Texas connection, how did you get connected <laughs> with uh, University of Texas San Antonio? What what was so interesting about the program that that drew you in, and what do you think that that, that people can really see there? Because we we learned that Oren, you know, twenty years ago already saw that that seed of, of the the University of Texas system being able to to bring this innovation and bring these skills. What have you What have you learned in your experience in the past few years? Right. So basically, back in about 2001, 1999, uh, I call that the digital divide between the digital immigrants and digital natives. We were talking about information assurance. So uh, some visionaries, uh, Joe Sanchez and others said, you know, we've got this university here in San Antonio, University of Texas uh, systems. You know, what can we do to uh, bring an academic rigor to uh, solidify our practices for infrastructure, assurance, cybersecurity, or, or uh, systems uh, security at that time, information technology. You know, we need a program of study. And so eventually, you know, fast forward to where we're at right now, uh, San Antonio, uh, the University of Texas San Antonio is one of maybe five universities that is a center of academic excellence certified by the National Security Agency and Department of Homeland Security in five subject matter areas uh, dealing with cyber proficiency and competency to not only give you a certification, but to really dig deep into researching how to uh, address, you know, the threats that are in our landscape, how to address 
even now, uh, when we're looking forward, uh, advanced uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning and how do we take data science and then apply that to where we've been in the past with information assurance, cybersecurity, and look at the complexity of all the operating systems that are out there because we know that with every new operating system, there are multiple lines of code that are being involved with that. And with every line of code, there is a chance of a vulnerability being exploited. So how can we use artificial intelligence? How can we use machine learning? How can we research and look forward to making the environment much more secure than what it is today? So that's one of the things that drew me uh, to the program of study, uh, the organization, the faculty and staff, they've done cluster hires from around the world to bring the brightest minds to solve these complex issues. And uh, right now we're in the middle of the final stages of our new complex in our downtown campus with the National Security Collaboration Center that's co-located with our School of Data Science. And it's a brand new, a brand new facility and structure that will on the bottom level have a gateway. And so when you come to San Antonio on the Riverwalk, you'll be able to walk inside and see this, you know, tremendous open space that will invite you into what it is to uh, explore information security, information technology, science, data, you know, uh, bricks in a loop, cyber and so forth. Mm -hmm. To take those digital natives by the hand uh, with some digital immigrants. So if you want to know that, that divide is remember the movie mm -hmm. Matrix? If you were born before the Matrix, oh, I, 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 re you might I remember be, those. I remember <laughs> you might those. be a digital immigrant, but uh, if you are, if you born after the Matrix, you are no <laughs> doubt a digital native. So you didn't have a choice between the pill. You were already in there. So we just have to build a, a, a strong bridge between them. So that's what so, drew me to the university. That, that's fascinating. So that that really gives us like a, a great transition to our next point. I'd love to hear how your experience, you know, 15, 20, 30 years ago, you know, understanding cyber and trying to, to put context to these ideas and these technologies has changed versus now you're more in the driver's seat. You, you've seen it, you know, in, the, in these very difficult situations in the military and you're trying to give it over to the next generation. How has this experience shaped your mentorship? How has it shaped your, your prioritization of skills? And how do you approach somebody now differently than you might have done it, you know, when, when you were in the military or you were kind of in, in this different different seat in your in your previous career? So maybe maybe Oren, maybe we could take it from here. Yeah, sure. Well, um, you know, during the the years with the military. Uh, we really faced a lot of, uh, you know, very, uh, you know, very big issues, a lot of cyber attacks. And I think Israel is considered to be the number one target uh, for cyber attacks. And uh, it's, it's not that, you know, a hacker is, is waking up in the morning and you know, decided to attack, but these are very uh, complex uh, attacks that, you know, people were working on them for, you know, months. And and I must say also on the other side, they're uh, skilled people. Uh, so what what we learned and is that it's a day by day, uh, war and it's a day by day challenge, but more of that, I think that the conclusion is for for cyber security. Uh, and this time we also hear about you know the cyber, you know NSO and other cyber, but we are cyber security and protection. That you should always you know, try to be uh, a step or two step ahead of, of your uh, uh, attacker. And by having said that, it's, it's, it's a lot of things involved with it and uh, a lot of activities associated with it. So the first one is, 
okay, try to think as the hacker is thinking and how your attacker is thinking about you and your network and what he would like to do and what approach he would like to take when he's thinking about, you know, attacking your network. Once you do that, well, it's open a wide range of thoughts and, you know, a wide range of, you know, uh, 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 doctrines and approaches and it really sharpened the discussion. And uh, at the end of the day, if you do it correctly, you can come up with a very good conclusions and with a very good solutions because, you know, the best uh, cybersecurity uh, thing to do is to shut down your computer. No doubt, right? Mm -hmm. so, but we, we would like to, to work. So I'm as uh, always, you know, uh, also the uh, head of the cybersecurity unit. My easiest way for, you know, and my customers were all the units, uh, the Israeli army. Mm -hmm. The best way and the convenient way was to say, just to say no. Hey, no, you are not allowed to do that. You are not allowed to do that. I don't connect this and uh, you don't need to do that. And I will sleep then very well. And uh, probably they won't be able to operate. But, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> this, is the, this is the game. So my philosophy was, okay, I'm not going to tell you what not to do. I'll tell you how to do things in the right way, in a secure way in a safe way, in a way that uh, you will be aware that there are risks uh, within these processes, but I give you the tools. I give you the tools, uh, you know, how to accommodate this risk, how to understand them, how to mitigate them. And also, of course, technology uh, and technological means that really help. And I think that you know it's uh, it's also it's also good for for my my job here uh, at Audix as as a CEO of Audix. We're dealing with cybersecurity, but you know we have hackers. Uh, they're getting sophisticated every day. So, for example, if you take a look at at sandboxes. So Sandbox was a wonderful technology. Hackers started to understand, okay, how it works, what it does. Now they want, they know how to evade this technology. They know how to bypass it relatively easily. So it's, uh, it's kind of a continuation in some way uh, for what we've done. And I think the experience that we have from the military operations and and all the uh, military projects really help uh, me, my company, and my uh, leading here uh, at Odex because we we know how to really navigate within this you know jungle. So it's really helping. So, so Oren, you brought up a really interesting point how how the leadership quality in the military has kind of shaped how you how you think and how you evolve and evaluate problems and then how you give that information over to the next level. Uh, I, I'd really be interested in hearing from Vic how you've kind of used that thinking and then turned that into curriculum and had that back and forth with the professionals who are going to be training this next generation uh, to be able to do it in, you know, at, at first, I assume, in a more theoretical sense, but then to be able to, to practically apply it. It's a little bit different to be able to build up the skill set versus having to be able to, to come up to the conclusion on the spot. So how did your military experience help guide your experience, and, and how do you use it on a daily basis to, to inspire and to, to kind of direct the, the young professionals that you're leading? Well, I, I have to definitely uh, say that I was challenged in my position of being uh, a leader on active duty by high school students. So here was a challenge. On Saturday morning, I'm normally in bed sleeping, right? So a friend of mine, Chris Cook said, Vic, uh, I want you to wake up and 
and come to this Mayor's Cup presentation uh, that's going to recognize the next generation of uh, cyber leaders. I'm going like, man, it's Saturday morning. I don't want to hear from the you know, young whippersnapper. But uh, <laughs> they challenged me, no kidding, because here it is 11 years ago, the Air Force Association, along with the Center for Infrastructure Assurance and Security at UTSA, came up with this concept of developing a virtual uh, machine whereby students had to take uh, steps to harden that operating system. So much like we have the sticks and we have all of the uh, hardening standards that are out there in industry, this was now being transferred into a high school and middle school setting. So to have a 16 year old, 17 year old stand up in front of the city mayor and say, you know, I have been working on hardening Windows operating systems, Linux operating systems, and now today looking at the Cisco network and securing network devices and information technology with uh, uh, the, the, the firewalls and setting up demilitarized zones and uh, turning on and off permissions and enabling functions and capabilities. And to have a high school student say, well, here, not only am I, you know, practicing this uh, as you professionals are doing this, but I have three certifications. You know, he has his network plug, he has his security plus, his, his, and he's in high school. And here I am, you know, beating my chest about, you know, I'm fielding all these cyber protection teams <laughs> and national military teams. And and these kids, you know, I'm, I'm assuming that they're playing, you know, uh, esports games with no consequence, but yet they're able to articulate the understanding, the need to defend our nation, you know, from, you know, from, you know, coming out of an academic setting uh, in, in before they even get to undergraduate school. Mm -hmm. So that is what challenged me. So mm -hmm. it's programs like Cyber Patriot. It's programs like the National Cyber League. It's mm -hmm. it's community leaders that are going out and being mentors, being coaches, and giving back to the next generation that challenged me in my military service to say, hey, look, we have got to do a better job in handing over to the next generation uh, our finished product, which will be their raw material so that they can do it better than we can. And oh, by the way, get out of the way. Because the mindset at that time, and even even still today, is that I'm a gray beard. Literally, now I'm a gray beard. Uh, I know more than the no beards. And so I'm like, no, you need to sit back, zip it, watch the no beards. And as they need assistance, and you need to guide them and, and, and provide that on ramp, that's where you know we need to come in today. So here we are today, uh, here in San Antonio, we have uh, the distinction of having the most Cyber Patriots teams that are fielded in the nation. Uh, we've had a national champion in the uh, in the service edition. Uh, we're competing with California, uh, and no 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 shade on California, but <laughs> Texas Texas is coming for you. But uh, you know, it's just so exciting to see. Uh, young leaders that are being inspired by gentlemen like Josh, uh, Josh uh, Beck, and Frank uh, uh, Frank Hall. You know, these are professionals who are now going back into the classroom and just really challenging them. So much so that in some cases we have high school students who are going into middle school and mentoring middle school students and teaching them the tactics, techniques, and procedures that we showcase and talk about with the MITRE ATT&CK framework. So to see that, that transition, to see that change, to them taking the baton, and like we're talking about the Olympics, you know, wow. we, have, we have some Olympians right now mm -hmm. Thinking about explaining the MITRE ATT&CK framework to a middle schooler and being able to have the relationship and the context, it's amazing. It's amazing yeah. to be able to break something down so granularly and understand how that's laying the foundation for their broader understanding of the attack surface. I think that's really cool. Right. Um, and and, and I, we have high school that are actively doing it right now. 
and mm-hmm. they're not only here in Texas, but around, you know, around the world, in, at least in, in around the United States that, that I've mm-hmm. seen. But it's very exciting. Yeah, it sounds very exciting. And this really brings me to my next question. I, I wonder what the relationship and the and the the balance of, of responsibilities between the the university system training young professionals and private enterprise and startups and cybersecurity companies taking taking the reins. Uh, Orrin, what do you what do you think the role of of cybersecurity companies to to actively train their professionals and be able to elevate that status beyond the baseline? Do you think it's their responsibilities? Do you think that that's a, a personal responsibility of the of the the candidate or the individual? In this question, Israel is I think is is different from the entire world because in Israel it turned out that the best education and the best school for cybersecurity is the Israeli army and the Israeli defense forces because. At the age of 18 in Israel, everyone's uh, obligation is to uh, and duty is to get to the military service. And, you know, these guys coming from high school and, uh, you know, most of them, you know, doing the, the service and then go to the universities. It turned out that they got a very good cyber education in their uh uh military service uh you could see a lot of startups companies initiated by uh uh, people that graduated and you know from 8200 or from my unit that uh, was the cyber defense unit so uh it also turned out right now and uh i'm not you know, reducing any value of the university because I think, you know, people should go there. But, you know, some people see that, okay, I can, when I can get off the service, I you know I can start my startup and I can, you know, grow my startup and do money. Why, why do I need a first degree? And this is, this is a real question because in the free market right now, uh, when you, you're looking for talents, you're looking for programmers, you said, okay, they, these are good guys coming from the, you know, out of the military, they know the, the, the best cybersecurity guys. I think that the universities and the academy has a great role in it because uh, all these guys that coming from, you know, the, the military service, they are great. And, you know, they are great hands-on and they can do everything you tell them to do. And, you know, they can penetrate everything that's moving and they can do whatever you like to do. But when dealing about a wide vision, when you're dealing about understanding uh, the real basics and the sources of everything and really the, the the task of the academy and the university is to teach you how to think and to provide you the tools that will be able you will be able you to think uh, better understand better and operate better and I'm, I'm quite confident you know if you take a guy that comes from the israeli you know military is an expert in cybersecurity in doing stuff but you know if you take someone that went through the academy and learn all the basic uh, you know either engineering or or computer science and that have a very wide understanding at the end of the day uh, I think it's it will be beneficial for for these guys because it can provide them, additional layer of thinking, uh, additional layer of understanding, and allow them to have a, a wonderful view. Of course, you can give me examples, you know, that people that, you know, without even a degree, I think Gil Schreit just finished his military service, established a checkpoint, 
and the rest is history, right? But uh, there's a lot of examples uh, for here and there, but in general, for the majority, uh, I think there's a, a huge contribution for, for academy universities and the tight relationship between industry, military, and academy. This this is the, this is the, the real challenge to make this connection and to work together. So, so Vic, I'd like to toss it over to you here. What do you think the the role of of universities in cyber education should be? Should it be a feeder system to the to private enterprises? Should it be a returning education mechanism to be able to train professionals who are already in it to be able to to hone their skill? What do, what do you think the ideal value of cybersecurity education in the university system is? Uh, you know, I think it's it's a challenge for universities because um, they they can be so large that a lot of students get uh, lost in the crowd. What a university should do is tailor itself such that the skills of the of the needs of the learner are tuned in so that that person can identify what they are designed to be deployed to do. You are not designed to be deployed to be a cog in a wheel. And I think some of our learners think that that's why they're going to school is to, to get the sheepskin to show that they have gone through a program of study so they can go into a corporation just to be a cog. No, you are designed to find a way that you can deploy your gifts and talents so that you can go into, in some cases, a corporation or a small enterprise or a large enterprise to hone your skills and define your craft so that you can then deploy yourself to either be an entrepreneur or uh, a facilitator and create of new opportunities and, and new directions. Um, I think we get too confined with uh, the mindset that uh, a career is based upon working uh, 40 years, 20 years, and then retiring to get a retirement. Well, guess what? That is blown out of the water right now because I don't know of many uh, careers that will now set you up to where you work 20 years, 40 years for a, a given company and then, you know, parachute out unless you're C-level, C-suite person. And, but, and even um, those positions, you know, few and far between, nobody wants to give you a pension anymore. But so what universities should do is fine tune the learner so that they can identify what their gifts and specific talents are so that they can then be deployed to release their gifts to the world, if that makes sense. And you don't hear that, mm -hmm. but that's what needs to be heard because far too often what I'm experiencing in my mentoring is the student graduates with a master's degree in electrical engineering. They're like, well, Vic, you know, how am I supposed to get started? You know, a lot of the companies are asking me to have X amount of years of experience before I can jump in, and I'm finding myself going into an entry level position to do a job to where it's beneath my capacity and capability to work. And I'm like, well, you know, that should have been a conversation that was had with you in your undergraduate so that you could then develop your experience through internships, through uh, cooperatives, through uh, going out and volunteering in your community and honing and crafting that that gift that is inside of you so that when you do graduate, you know, you can then kind of navigate through your career so that when you're 40, 50 years old, you're not looking back with a lot of regret as to mm -hmm. why did I go to school and get this degree anyway? Mm -hmm. Very Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Yeah. For sure, it definitely it gives hope for for those of us with degrees in Central Asian Studies. Um, 
<laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you need to have an intervention in undergrad. Um, right. so, exactly, exactly. I think it's it's very interesting to to hear this balance in, in understanding the the needs of the student, understanding how how these different avenues can can shape your understanding, and seeing especially you know or in going through both of the these channels, going through the university system to your PhD, and also having twenty years in the military and trying to understand. How, how are people giving this information over? How are they prioritizing this? And how are they comp saying, you know, as an individual, I care about you. I'm going to invest in you. So the skill set is going to be something that that's going to pay dividends beyond your specific role. So I, I think that that's it's really interesting to hear and to hear how how that interchange is really important for the for the person, the organization to develop. Um, that that really it kind of brings me into into our next point. Um, Vic, the other day, the University of Texas San Antonio had a had event on cyber resilience, right? Trying to to bring these concepts into something that's a little bit more tangible. Can you kind of tell us a little bit about how that went? What what was the, the impetus of this event, and you know what did what did the participants really gain from it? Sure thing. Thanks thanks for the opportunity to share. We just had the uh, Small Business Development Center from San Antonio hosts the Texas Rural Challenge 2021. Uh, we took a break in 2020, obviously because of the global pandemic, but we did this a virtual event to address the needs of, let's say, those who were not in a urban or a city or a large populated section um, uh, arrangement. You know, they're out there doing energy in the in production, or they're doing agriculture, or they're doing non, uh, I would say, um, high population type, you know, cluster job things. They're spread out, so it's rural. Mm -hmm. So the Texas Rural Challenge allowed us uh, to work with economic developers uh, to address the issues that we um, experience with regards to cyber, because cyber is out there. Uh, you have a lot of rural farmers who are using artificial intelligence and smart uh, smart devices to connect to the internet. You know how can they do that safer and and more secure? So we hosted this event. We had you know representations from uh, small town uh, Texas and and then folks from uh, large large municipalities and working with. Uh, businesses to understand how they can get a paycheck protection loan and and how to address those challenges uh, that face them uh, that are just a little bit more challenging and unique than let, let's say those who are in a in a populated setting. We did a session. Uh, Guy Walsh, who is the executive director of the National Security Collaboration Center, on a, an initiative to where we we're working with small nonprofits and faith-based organizations to address their cyber resiliency. Uh, so we took MITRE, which is a uh, FFRDC led by Bobby Blunt, uh, who's our local uh, leader. And we had some mentors that were assigned to some college students to go into these faith-based organizations, synagogues, uh, houses of worship, imams, and then these nonprofits that you know, support the community uh, in, a, in a generous way with little to no budget. But we did an assessment to say, you know, what is going on inside your community uh, that you may not know is a threat to you with regards to, let, let's face it, the ransomware attacks that have been happening globally around the world. Last year, we had forecasted that in 2021 the damage due to uh, cyber attacks would be six trillion dollars. And when I was saying that during the pandemic, it was like want 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 Charlie Brown. But now, after the the uh, the pipeline uh, shut down, after the food manufacturing shut down, and now this managed service provider that you know got attacked with you know uh, their their services to small businesses and rural communities. Now we're able to tell them, hey, look, even though you may have a managed service provider, you still have a responsibility and accountability to manage those end user devices and make sure that you're doing your due diligence to keep your 
uh, environment secure. We're in a remote work configuration. So my responsibilities here working from remote from home is, yeah, I'm on a browser right now. Ask yourself in the audience, have you updated your browser in the last month? There have been three updates on Google Chrome in the month of July. There have been 15 updates on the Apple operating system to date here in 2021. So the frequency and the intensities of updates and the responsibilities of end users has increased, you know, quantum. So we just can't assume a way that your IT department is going to be that, you know, one stop shop that's going to, you know, secure your environment, especially when we're looking to the cloud and, and looking at, you know, how you can remote work from anywhere. You still have a responsibility to secure that environment around you. So like when I'm working from home, I shut my door and I make sure that there's no one coming in uh, into the space without, you know, urgent need, you know, mm -hmm. every now and then, you know, the 14 year old comes in and wants a hug, but you know, I'm like, okay, you know, th this, this was not a good time, but you know, yeah. your, your the, urgent the need, like I guess that. is a little so, bit more, more strong on, uh, on your end than it gets right, to be on. Right. Your yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I, I'd like to, to kind of uh, pass it over to, to Oren. Can you, can you kind of give us your insights on, on cyber resilience, the, the importance of, of, you know, SMBs and these rural partners to be able to prioritize cyber on the same level that, that traditional enterprises and, and the big players do? Yeah, definitely. And, and, and uh, I think I have a, a very good story about this because if we go back to uh, 2019, uh, I approached the, the European Commission in the Horizon 2020 program. This is kind of prestigious program to uh, uh, promote a lot of technology in Europe and globally. And I told them, listen, over 90% of the world transactions are done by SMBs. Now, these SMBs, you know, they don't have as fixer, they don't have the awareness, they don't have the capabilities to protect themselves. They, they, they don't understand in cybersecurity. And I show them that over 60% of the SMBs that suffer cyber attacks went out of business within like six months. And I, I told them this is, this is a real pain, this is a real issue. And I suggested them that we had a great technology at that time and we knew how to uh, 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 remove and neutralize malware that come within files. And I told them, listen, I can take my technology, which is already you know, proven in the field, works for enterprises, large enterprises, and I can make it uh, accessible and affordable for SMBs. So first of all, they like the idea very much. And we, we awarded the grant of the 2 million euro. And we were lucky, uh, you know, to be one of the few that got uh, this grant. And we had a great program. And this was the beginning and the launch of Firewall. Firewall is Firewall for Files. But... It, this is the tool that is provided for SMBs. And when you think about SMBs, you need to think differently because SMBs, you know, they consume their, you know, IT services, the cybersecurity as services. You know, they don't want to mess with on-prem products and you don't, they don't want to mess with, you know, management and so on. They would like to have someone like, a managed service providers or a managed security service provider, they will do the job for them and actually will make some of the tools accessible for them. And this is exactly what we've done. So we, we make this, you know, Piva to make it a pure SaaS product that will be available for SMBs by, you know, a single click deployment, no, not, no need for any configuration and no need for maintenance and so on. And of course, affordable. So I think that SMBs, it's, um, it's a different creature that needs uh, a different treatment 
and you know uh, it's it's a mistake to treat you know all enterprises large and small and you know and la very large enterprises and so on in the same way you need to understand the on one hand you, you need to understand the pain of each sector but on the other hand you need to understand their capabilities you need to understand uh, their uh, skills and their expectations and at the end of the day you would like to align the expectations and this is the the name of the game to to align the expectations so you know they'll get they feel safe and you know they know that they they are in uh, good hands very very interesting so i'm going to uh to ask you guys for uh for your closing remarks before we uh before we wrap it up what do you uh, i'll switch it to to vic here what do you think the the most important thing in cyber education moving forward is what, what should somebody be focusing in on when they're looking for a, a cyber education program what's the thing that, that's going to drive them what's going to to bring the most value what do you think the, that they should really be looking for Wow. Um, it depends on the individual. And so, and, and I would say it this way, there are so many facets that are involved with cybersecurity that far too often in my, in my uh, interactions, people are thinking that it's only technical, but a lot of it is psychological because it's the human form factor because what is cybersecurity? it's taking people processes and technology to protect information so notice what i started with people so our hr professionals need to be more attuned as to how do you do a quality background investigation on the individual that you're bringing into your organization and how that impacts the risk management on the back end because a lot of times they're like well i'm just trying to fill this person because they have these qualifications but they may have the qualifications but what about their you know that 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 follow-up interview on their references you know have you looked at their social media footprint to find out what their behaviors are because that really speaks a lot to you know what you're bringing in to your organization as far as culture and have you talked to your CEO, you know, to map that with your strategic priorities within your company? Uh, and then you go into legal. Uh, I talk with small businesses all the time. And I say, you know, as part of your disaster recovery plan, as a part of your cyber resiliency, you need to have a strong relationship with someone who has a legal subject matter expert in the area of privacy, in the area of data, in the area of cyber and information technology, so that they can give you sound counsel and and uh, and, and insight as to how you protect that information and how you communicate, because there are liabilities, especially now with GDPR, which is the General Data Protection uh, Regulation in Europe, that treats privacy as a human right. It's now here in the United States with the California Consumer Protection Act. You know, you as a business owner, if you have any kind of uh, point of sales or uh, you're taking a credit card transaction, you have a responsibility and a liability as to how you protect and support that information that's going back and forth across your network. God forbid you're a small business. Oh, yeah, well, I just have my smartphone and I just swipe that card. Okay, what applications do you own on, on, on that smartphone? And are those smartphone applications updated so that when you swipe that transaction, you don't have personal information that's now being dumped on your phone that belongs to someone else? And oh, by the way, your phone gets lost or compromised, your business just went down. And then to Orange Point, you can spend 50 years, 100 years building your business. In one transaction, you're out of business. Mm -hmm. So you need to have you know sound legal advice that's you know based upon those principles and we need graphic artists we need teachers we need educators so there is a wide uh, uh, collage that people need to think about when we talk about cybersecurity futures and careers uh, we need you know 
uh, gamers that can, you know, take games like Watchdog. I mean, when that game came out, I was like, dude, if you're a Watchdog gamer, you know, hey, look, we want you, we need you, you know, take that skill, take that experience, take that that drive and that passion, and now apply it to be a part of a cyber protection team, apply that to be a part of a national mission team, apply that to be an open source research intelligence analyst so that you can shape and help us protect, you know, the, the way forward. And we have to break our paradigm, you know, as governments, as communities, as society, and we think local and act global. So we, we just have to take a, a wider view as to the way we've looked at cyber in the past, moving forward with artificial intelligence, machine learning, data science, uh, the arts, STEM, STEAM, uh, let, let's get into this, you know, let, let's get into the, these um, middle schools and high schools and 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 listen to what they're saying. And it's, I love the new movie. I don't know if you've seen it yet. I'm not getting any any royalties on it, but Space Jam, you know, uh, the story is great. I'm not going to give it away. But, you know, you see LeBron James and you see his son. So watch the plot line. That's what we need to see in cyber. It's not about making another, you know, uh, Bill Gates or another uh, Wozniak or even, you know, the guy from Facebook, uh, Zuckerberg. You know, there are a lot of smaller folks that are out there that have, you know, unique gifts and talents. Let's let them be them, but guide them, you know, to do it smartly and support them where we can. Very interesting. Oren, to, to kind of wrap it up on your end, what do you think the, the role of the private sector and cybersecurity startups should be taking in pushing cybersecurity education for both their employees, but also for the broader public? Well, um, I think as far as, you know, cyber education and uh, we talked about a lot about it in the, in the last hour uh, and uh, so first of all, I owe Vic uh, for his wonderful statement from digital immigrant to digital natives. I fell in love with it. And, uh, actually, I think I missed the train. I will always remain an immigrant, but uh, okay, we need to take care of the youngsters and uh, make sure to educate the really digital natives uh, on, the, on the right course. I, I think three things are important when you're talking about the, the cyber education, and this is awareness, awareness, and awareness. <laughs> and this is, a, this is the key. Uh, and if you start from low, you know, low school to high school, and uh, you start to, you know, tell the these little boys make them understand let them understand the benefits of networking let them understand the benefits of you know internet but on the other hand start to educate them that there's also risk in that and you need to show them you need to uh give them real examples uh how things happen so because you know sometimes stories you know it's hard to believe some of them like science fiction. They said, okay, they, okay, how they penetrate to this and how they did this. I mean, impossible. I want, it won't happen to me. So I think the education for, for awareness, for, for understanding uh, the root cause of, of, you know, how the hacker is thinking, how he penetrates, how he finds his path into the network. What, what, what are the, the payload that he needs to take in order to, you know, do his attacks and so on. So he understand that it's doable, it's there, and he needs to take it seriously and he needs to protect himself. And this should be done from very early stage, from, from the beginning and all the way. And as you grow up with your education and with your age, provide you, you know, better and better tools and better and better understanding. And I think this would do the job. 
So on that note, I, I really want to thank uh, Oren and Vic for taking the time to, to speak with us and really give over their experience. It's been fascinating to hear, and I hope our audience enjoyed it as much as I did. Thank you so much for your time, and we look forward to, to speaking with you guys soon on the Malware Free Broadcast. Bye, everybody. <laughs>